Great, thanks so much, Natalie. Um, so we are now gonna turn to, to our four teachers who are presenting today. And they were given these three guiding questions. And so these, this is what they'll be responding to. They'll be telling us a little bit about the context that they live and teach in and how their school and country responded to the coronavirus outbreak. Um, they're gonna speak a little bit about one or two main challenges they faced as an educator and what they did to overcome those challenges. And they'll speak about the, some of the challenges and needs that they saw their students and families facing and how they supported their students. And so as you listen to them speak, I really encourage you to think comparatively to your own experience. Think about how that um, illuminates some of your own challenges. Think about some of the things that might be the same, that might be different, and things that we can learn from each other. And I encourage you um, to, like I said, use the chat bar for questions, but also feel free to use the chat bar for comments as well as as you're seeing and hearing these, um, these ideas, feel free to reflect um, on what you hear. So we're gonna turn first, next slide, Basna. I'm gonna invite Bruna Inglese to join us, um, to unmute yourself. Um, she is Italian, she lives in Northern Italy. Um, she has taught in English in middle school until last year, and now she teaches English language and culture in high school. Um, she's also a consultant for the IU Global Gateway for Teachers program, and she's actually going to be speaking to us today about primarily what she's been seeing in at the elementary level. Um, so, um, Bruna, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. I hope you can hear me fine. Yes, I can hear you. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity and this Special hello to Dr. Stokowski. I've, I've seen her in the chat. Uh, hi, Laura. And uh, it's also thanks to her that I'm here today. As Ellie said, I live and teach in Italy and I have experience in middle school and high school. But given my role in the Global Gateway for Teachers program, I've been in touch with lots of elementary schools around uh, our region. And that's why I want to focus on them today. So we can start the uh, presentation um, uh, with the first introduction. Uh, so this is a typical uh, setting in our elementary schools, uh, which will be completely revolutionized in September, I'm sure. Um, so we can move on to the first slide, actually the next slide, where uh, we have a look at the context where we work and our colleagues work. Elementary schools are always part of a bigger institution, which includes um, kindergarten, elementary, and middle school. So that ends with eighth grade. And most of our elementary schools average uh, about 250 students. Uh, the students are divided into classes, um, and the groups are, include about 20, 25 students. And the groups remain the same for five years. Uh, and also the teachers, uh, they have two main teachers and they also remain the same for five years usually. So uh, there's a very strong bond that forms among uh, students and uh, between the students and the two teachers. Uh, the location, as you saw on the map, uh, we are in Northern Italy, we are in Lombardy. And Lombardy is the region where the whole outbreak of the virus uh, uh, happened in February here. Uh, the students all come, well, most of them come from middle class, lower middle class, sometimes upper middle class backgrounds. But we also have a relevant a number of immigrants uh, that amount to about 15% of the total. And especially in elementary schools, their presence is, is felt. Oftentimes, the families don't speak the language very well. Uh, the students might be the only ones in the family who speak Italian. And so that leads to a whole set of problems, some of them I will mention uh, later. Uh, now, how we dealt with the crisis in general, uh, well, the government uh, intervened pretty soon. Uh, so in our region, all the schools were closed on starting on February the 24th. Um, and it wasn't clear at first how long we would stay closed for. 
And then on March the 5th, uh, they decided to extend uh, the closure to the whole country. Uh, and so we entered lockdown that lasted until May the 5th. But schools remained closed. Uh, so uh, one issue we had was that we didn't have clear guidance from the Ministry of Education that kept postponing the dates and we were not sure what would happen actually in the end. So at a certain point it became clear that schools would not open at all. And uh, after a couple of weeks or so, the ministry started saying um, that we had to use uh, online teaching with, uh, with our students. Then we can move on to the next slide because um, I want to focus now on what the main challenges were for educators and for teachers. Uh, now, as I said, we uh, are in an area which is, let's say, the most affluent part of the country. So in theory, you would, so, so, you know, you would assume that everybody had means, uh, had the technology at home, but that's not true. Um, a few families lack the means. Uh, they don't have the technology at home. So the big challenge uh, for, the, for the teachers uh, was being able to reach all their students uh, so that everybody could have access to online learning. Um, now this had a couple of um, aspects, both practical and social and cultural. The practical aspect uh, that of course some families didn't have the means or uh, maybe they had one computer that had to be used by mm, the parents that worked at home or by the uh, older brothers or sisters who were in high school. Uh, so what the schools did and what the government did was uh, to have funds available uh, so that uh, they could buy computers or laptops or tablets for the families who requested some help. And so in the end, all the schools that I've heard from, um, basically 95 of the students uh, had access to online learning. Um, in some cases, the schools actually lent all the equipment they had, computers, tablets, whatever, to the families who requested it. Um, again, if the families requested it, uh, so some families who didn't, uh, of course, we couldn't do anything about that. And here the issue of being maybe from a poor background, immigrant families, that played a role. But the lack of um, means also, uh, had something to do with uh, the, the social and cultural background of the family, uh, of the families themselves, because of course families had to be available for their kids to help their kids uh, get online, for example, um, or use the technology. And some families simply didn't have the time uh, because of course we were during lockdown, but uh, lots of people still had to work. Um, and some people had to leave the house and, and go to work, or some other people had to stay indoors and work at home, but they didn't have time for their kids, or some people simply lacked the skills uh, it took to help their children. Um, so in this case, there isn't much we could do about that. Uh, another challenge we had was to find new ways of teaching and evaluate evaluating the, the, the work that the students did. Um, and I think that's common for everybody. Um, basically, nobody felt they were prepared for this, so they had to jump in uh, and learn as they went. Uh, there was hardly any training offered by schools, except very late in the season. So I remember, for example, in my school, they started offering courses online in May, and it's like, thank you, we've already learned what we needed to know by now. Uh, but one positive effect is that this really stimulated uh, teachers to be creative um, in what they could do with their students and their classes, and in using the new uh, technology also. Um, so teachers started, for example, uh, before they could actually start uh, online teaching, uh, they started recording materials, uh, even using social media like WhatsApp, uh, recording things that the students could listen to on their parents' phone, for example, um, um, asking them to watch a movie uh, and then 
make drawings on the movie and then making a video of all the movies, of all the drawings that they could uh, see, um, all sorts of things. And another aspect that was related to new ways of teaching was also finding new ways of evaluation. Of evaluation. Um, and so schools basically reformulated their criteria to include new aspects like uh, participation, a willingness to be online, to follow lessons online, and um, ability to uh, meet the deadlines that the teachers would set online. Um, and so that, of course, helped uh, boost some grades. And so the teachers felt they needed the, to explain to the families that the grades might not actually be based on performance, but more on other, on different criteria. Um, before we, I, before I move on to the next slide, one thing that a lot of teachers felt was the lack of common guidelines from principals from the school itself. So everybody was basically on their own, more or less. Um, some schools were better than others, but usually um, teachers were left to decide whether to give online classes or not, uh, how often that would be. Um, and that was an issue more, I think, in uh, middle and high school, more than elementary school. Um, so yes, going on now to, let's say, considering online learning from the point of view of families and, uh, and students, they faced some challenges as well. Um, if we think of the families of the parents, uh, what they mostly felt was that their kids stay engaged. Um, this because they didn't want their kids to spend all their time squandering their time basically uh, playing games or being on social media. So that was a, a need that was felt very strongly and that's why lots of them complained uh, because online teaching actually started late. Uh, in some elementary schools I asked um, their lessons started as late as April. So they spend the whole time uh, in March just sending messages or texting or sending emails, but that was not the same, of course. And another challenge the families had was to be there to help their kids. And if we think about first and second graders, um, they needed help. They needed help to get online, uh, to stay on track, to follow the instructions, and uh, the way the teachers um, and the schools decided to, to act was to schedule classes very late during the day, um, sometimes as late as 4 p.m. So in some schools, classes started online at 4 uh, until 6 p.m., some other schools at 2. Uh, and that served a double purpose. Uh, first of all, uh, the parents were more likely to be there. Uh, and second, um, if you think of families where there are more than, of course, one kid, if they had an older sibling uh, in high school or middle school, their lessons would be in the morning. And so that would make things easier for the family um, in case they had maybe one computer only. Um, and it was easier anyway for everybody to have one kid having lessons in the morning and the younger kid having lessons in the afternoon. That was one more minute. Okay, I'm basically done. Uh, and the children felt the need to be with their teachers. And so the teachers devised lots of ways. They recorded stories or fairy tales they could listen to maybe even before going to bed. So in this way, they kept in touch with their students. So uh, we are hoping that we will be ready in September for further challenges. <laughs> and that's move on to the last slide, which is just, thank you. Great, thanks so much, Bruna. There's um, one sort of clarifying question from Nicole. She asks, um, so you scheduled online classes live instead of posting assignments to an online platform? Is that correct? Well, uh, I, I, again, that was up to the teachers. Um, most of the teachers tried to schedule classes online, uh, live. Um, some teachers, especially in uh, higher grades, decided not to. They spent material to do or assignments to do. 
uh, but there was no guidelines. I mean, everybody basically decided on their own. Uh, and I think some, you know, there was a general agreement that it would have been better, especially for a single school to have a common policy um, so that there wouldn't be any difference uh, between different classes or grades or. Great, thanks. And I think this might actually be something interesting to come back to in the Q&A. Um, but let's go on to the next slide. Um, so we're going to go on to our next speaker, who's Hadil Kazim, who teaches elementary, teaches English at an elementary private school in Syria. Um, she's based in Damascus, Syria, and she's she is she has joined us today, but her internet is a little bit spotty, so she's actually pre-recorded videos that we're going to share with you. Um, so it's a series of five short videos that we're gonna listen to. Um, but like I said, she is here. So if you have questions either now or later, she'll be able to answer them. So let's go ahead with her first video. My name is Hadil Kazim. I am an English teacher. I have a BA in English uh, language and literature. I graduated in 2008 and since then I am teaching English with the breaks with the breaks now and then because I have kids. Uh, now I now I am teaching in a private school uh, in, in Damascus, Syria. Um, I, I teach uh, third grade, fourth grade and fifth grade. Uh, I teach in uh, elementary school in an elementary school. Um, our school is private and we take uh, we, we take care of our kids and our students and we have a good circulium we have a good staff of uh, teachers um, now about the uh, now with the outbreak of the coronavirus in the world the city and government decided immediately to take uh, precautionary precautionary measures uh, like uh, uh, like from the beginning uh, the 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 government decided to cut down or to to uh, to uh, to close the borders with the borders with uh, Lebanon because uh, from the beginning Lebanon was witnessing an increased number of uh, coronavirus and we have uh, uh, we have this movement between uh, Syria and Lebanon um, uh, Syrian uh, go to Lebanon and Lebanon, Lebanese people come here to Syria a lot uh, and all and after a few days um, uh, we cut down also the border borders with um, with Iraq and uh, Jordan also because both countries were witnessing also an increased number of coronavirus at that time. Uh, that was a very important uh, decision to be made because at that time, I mean, at the beginning, we didn't witness actually any uh, cases here in Syria. But unfortunately, nowadays, and I'm talking about uh, months after the uh, shutdown, when the government decided to reopen, and, uh, partially, uh, of course, uh, we are witnessing here, unfortunately, uh, uh, we are witnessing, yes, uh, increased number of uh, cases of coronavirus uh, uh, first of all it was uh, from Lebanon from out uh, out of Syria but unfortunately uh, now it is uh, spreading uh, locally spread it is yes from uh, Syrian here Uh, now, when the government decided to shut down the schools, the restaurants, uh, uh, markets, almost everything, uh, that was announced on TV, of course, that uh, schools was uh, has to be shuttered. And it was also, of course, for the safety of uh, the students and the, the kids. Um, uh, we we uh, tr uh, tr we we continue t teaching uh, of course uh, our kids had to, had to be uh, educated no matter um, uh, what method we uh, we use uh, so if, uh, so for our school i have to say that uh, we use uh, from the beginning of the year we use the um, Facebook application and the WhatsApp application. Now we use the Facebook to to uh, to announce uh, out for for general announcement, uh, like if there is uh, something uh, for the for the all of the grades, we 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 post it on the uh, school's page. Um, for the WhatsApp, we have uh, for each grade, for each class, we have 
a group on WhatsApp. The group contains the students' families and the uh, the, the teachers of the subjects. Now, uh, when the school was shuttered, uh, of course, we continue using the groups of the WhatsApp. That was uh, easy for the parents, and I uh, and I insist on using this uh, application, the WhatsApp, because uh, it is familiar here in Syria. All people here use the WhatsApp, so uh, we continue using these groups uh, to communicate with the the students' parents. The students' parents were uh, very helpful. Um, they helped me they cooperate with me um now for for uh, for, uh, for me uh, first of all i have to say that i uh, was uh, i tried to be calm uh, for my for my for my students not to feel stress because it wasn't easy for them to shift suddenly uh, from giving uh, lessons uh, um, uh, as usual in the classroom uh, to go uh, immediately to uh, teach online so it was it was really uh, i think it wasn't easy for us for all of us but we worked hard on that we worked as teachers in our school in a good plan uh, to uh, to continue teaching and to continue um, uh, connecting with the students um, I sent the videos of uh, the lessons on the WhatsApp. I send uh, sometimes my video no, um, um, uh, sometimes I send uh, voice voice notes of me uh, explaining some um, some points. Uh, I, I also send them uh, some exercises. I wait for them to answer these exercises. I uh, was uh, all I all the time I, I was all the time ready for any question. If there is any question, if there is any miss understand of anything of any point in the lesson uh, i spread the subjects uh, during the whole week like two days we concent we focus on math and science two days we focus on reading two days we focus on um, exercises uh, students was uh, students were uh, working with me. Uh, I sent them some exercises to work uh, at home um, uh, for my students not to uh, to forget um, uh, learning. Now uh, that was that worked. That worked. Uh, I think that was good for us. Uh, I try to encourage my students uh, by asking them to send me some videos for them uh, while they are reading or while they are with while they are doing their homework or they are uh, doing an exercise and I send their uh, videos or I send their pictures on the school's page on Facebook and that was uh, good for them uh, it was an encouraging uh, uh, way somehow uh, now, I have to mention that from the beginning of uh, shutting the schools down, we, uh, we, uh, the, the, the Ministry of Education uh, here in Syria uh, f uh, immediately put some links on internet, online, uh, the, which the, any student can uh, easily just click on the link and uh, choose the grade and choose the lesson choose the subject and he or she can easily listen to the uh, to, to the lesson uh, that was uh, a very um, uh, good uh, uh, good thing to made by the uh, ministry of education end of the year when the, the, the when we we witness uh, cases uh, uh, increasing in, increased in Syria the ministry decided to cancel the final exams and uh, uh, just uh, we uh, just to make exams for the ninth grade and the 12th grade here in Syria because in, the, in both uh, both grades here are very important for students students take certificate for the, uh, from passing these uh, two grades uh, other grades uh, moved uh, to the next uh, uh, grade uh, and the of course the ministry uh, put a good plan uh, to compensate everything was missed um, last year hopefully actually uh, uh, that's what we. That's how we handle the teaching uh, field uh, during the uh, shutting down the schools and during the pandemic. Uh, 
um, it wasn't easy for us, all of us, I think, all over the world. But it is um, a hard time, and we have to uh, to be uh, strong to pass these uh, these uh, uh, hard time. Now moving to challenges. If uh, when when we when we want to talk about talk challenges, uh, we have to mention that uh, uh, here in Syria the electricity made a challenge here for us because not all the time we have electricity and not all the time we have power uh, sometimes uh, we have uh, four or six hour, uh, hours uh, without electricity uh, of course spreading uh, during the 24 hours uh, so uh, it is it was difficult for us as teachers to uh, to connect to connect with the students or to uh, give a lesson for all students at the same time. That was the first challenge. The second challenge was the internet, as I um I don't know if I mentioned it. Uh, uh, the, the, the speed of the internet uh, is somehow weak. The, the internet is not stable all the time. So this was a second challenge uh, for us. Uh, if we want to talk about challenges, uh, yes, uh, uh, students m had some difficulties in download some pictures and videos uh, during the uh, lessons. Now, also, in my opinion, there is a challenge for me as a mother and other mothers. I think uh, the, the 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 time was passing so hard for all of us because being home with this with the children, the ho the housework, um, and sometimes with our husbands. Uh, so all the family is at home, uh, and that was a boring time. It was uh, so hard for me as a mother to teach my children to continue learning to continue teaching them and also to continue uh, as a teacher to continue teaching my students so I think that was uh, a challenge for all of us uh, to uh, in this uh, in this pandemic before we go on to the next video it sounds like they're it's hard to tell if the background noise is from the video or from anyone who is unmuted um, but it, please make sure that you're on mute. And let's go ahead with the next video. We want to talk about how uh, the this uh, uh, pandemic affected us uh, in other uh, aspects in our life. Uh, with the shutdown of uh, uh, of schools, as I said, restaurants and almost almost everything, uh, uh, economy uh, the economy collapsed. Uh, not just in Syria, all over the world. Uh, it is it was uh, uh, really uh, the, the economy really affected. It was has been affected. Uh, and uh, we have to mention that uh, that uh, also the sanctions uh, made it worse here in Syria because uh, uh, because we have uh, shortage in power, we have shortage in uh, in. Uh, 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 in some medicine uh, stuffs, uh, so any so people here cannot find uh, the simple uh, the simple. Uh, needs that they they need in their life uh, also i have to say that the prices the prices are skyrocketing uh, the prices are really jumping uh, crazily uh, after they reopen uh, i can't uh, i can't compare actually the prices and that uh, also uh, affected the, uh, the 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 schools or the educational side because n now the private schools uh, or almost all schools uh, the private uh, i mean the, the, the almost all the private schools um, uh, the, the the fees are becoming uh, so high, so not all uh, not all uh, families could uh, pay the the private schools. Uh, so that affected also the uh, the schools. Now also we ha I have to say that. Uh, uh, the, the, the 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 crisis uh, these crises uh, affected uh, the educational part in uh, uh, in um Another negative effect of the Western sanctions on Syria was the stoppage of any sort of Western educational and cultural missions here. Um, 
Prior to that Syrian, uh, uh, prior to that Syrian crisis, there used to be a lot of British, American, and other Western scholars who visit the country and made uh, workshop uh, shops here. That also uh, that was uh, uh, useful for the uh, educational uh, uh, for, for education here in, in general in Syria. So that was also a, a point to talk about. Uh, now. Uh, I, I hope I could um, if, if help you uh, in a way or another to share uh, how we uh, uh, how we uh, we, we was uh, 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 we was how we handled uh, the education or the uh, teaching field here in Syria during these crises. And uh, thank you for all of us. And thank you for all of you. Great, thank you so much, Hadil. That was really great. Um, we're gonna go to our next presenter. Um, also, by the way, thank you everyone for the questions that you've been posing in the chat and for some of the reflections. I think it's been really, really exciting to see some of these questions and comparisons being made. And um, so our next speaker is um, Kenjagul Kadirova. And Kenji Gul is an English middle and high school teacher at the Republican Mathematics and Physics School in Almaty, Kazakhstan. Um, so let's go to the next slide. And Kenji Gul, are you with us? Let's um, take yourself off of mute. Kendrigal, we can't hear you. All right, well, why don't we go to the next presenter and I'll see if we can get Kendrigal unmuted. Um, so Vesna, let's skip ahead and Olena. Um, we'll have you speak in, for now, um, and then we can go back to Kenji Gul. So Olena Stadkevich has been teaching English. Um, hey, the, can um, you hear me? We can hear you. Um, um, and she's a senior teacher at her high school. So go ahead, Olena. Good morning. Ukrainian school joined the process of distance learning organized just as schools were closed due to the quarantine. Uh, all the ch TV channels in our country were involved into the process of broadcasting the lesson given by the teachers of Ukraine according to the school program. Educational sites such as to the lesson and similar to it were created and supported and the teachers could upload it to Google Classroom. Our school decided did not. Uh, uh, our school did not wait for detailed instructions, and organized the process of distant learning by using the knowledge and experience of our teachers. As the majority of Ukrainian schools, we have been using such applications as Zoom Classroom as well as additional applications. The particular teachers who possessed the required knowledge made short video instructions for all the colleagues and organize the courses to teach those who don't possess such knowledge. New timetable of the lessons and new timetable of control works were created. Our principal and her substitutes were given access to our electronic classes to control the quality of the lessons. Being an English teacher, uh, I and my pupils were given access to electronic versions for English textbooks published in Great Britain. Uh, this uh, software allowed us to teach and control pupils and perform such activities as reading, writing, use of English. It uh, meant that I was uh, in the privileged uh, position. Uh, not every teacher had the necessary equipment at home. And that's why our school and the principal of the school came to the conclusion to provide teachers with the necessary devices. A lot of our teachers faced up with several problems. It was necessary to teach the pupils while educating themselves. 
in our school, the problem was solved in a very simple, at the same time, very complicated way for us. Because the first months we worked for almost uh, 15 uh, hours per day to master the required knowledge. And of course, it took more time to prepare for the lessons than before. It took us a lot of time to communicate with parents and pupils, helping them and answering all the questions. Our parents, pupils, and teachers filled in the questionnaires prepared by the administration of school to find out their opinion on distant learning three times at the beginning of quarantine, after the months of distance learning, and at the end of the year. And of course, without the help of my husband and son, I could not solve the problems and overcome the difficulties. So, uh, the challenges. Uh, the next slide, thank you. The lack of individual communication between the teacher and the pupils could possibly turn the teacher into the person whose job is only to pass the knowledge without educational function. This system of endless and typical tasks, as well as the necessity to explain the new material and to give and check homework, caused uh, the loss of creative component and excessive formalization when the educational process is turned into the process of obtaining high marks. Before quarantine, the system was balanced by the number of class lessons and creative component. I believe that it is dangerous to make the system of giving tasks and checking them the main source of getting marks. Some pupils, in order to get high marks, try to substitute the process of learning and analysis of obtained information uh, into the process of Googling books, uh, workbooks, answers without analysis. Thus, such essential skill as creative thinking was put into danger of disappearing. Why should I learn if I can simply Google? Doing the homework meant mainly searching for the information without analysis and uh, without, uh, therefore, without obtaining the corresponding skill. One of the most important points is the teacher and his or her personality. Frankly speaking, I believe that pupils are overfed by technique. So uh, we need to make them interested in what they are doing. There is saying the mind is not a vessel that needs filling, but wood that needs igniting. It might belong to Plutarch, the ancient philosopher, and I believe that it is the essence of the teacher's job. Uh, the next slide, thank you. Uh, Two ideas have helped me to solve the problem. And the first idea is that my lessons should be more creative and interesting. My task is to encourage pupils to think. And the second is that pupils should read more than usual. They have more time. Joseph Brodsky, who was awarded by the Nobel Prize in Literature in 1987, said that the man is a product of reading. I would also like to quote Rene Descartes, a reading of all good books is like conversation with the finest man of past century. Our life experience is measured. That's why, why should not we use the life experience of other people who, for example, were cleverer than I am? I would like to demonstrate you three tasks um, of the intellectual game prepared for my pupils. Being fond of literature and history, I decided to describe some situations uh, that my pupils were unlikely to know. Their task was to remember everything they knew about the epoch and the people of that epoch and use their logical thinking. Moreover, the process of thinking and their right answer uh, were appreciated in equal share. Uh, I would like to start with uh, the third picture. Uh, of course, you have found out, you have guessed it's um, the little prince. When the little prince was traveling, he visited the planet where the sensible king lived. He felt lonely and wanted the little prince to stay with him. He promised to appoint the little prince the minister of justice. But the prince answered that there was nobody to judge on the planet. My pupils should answer the question, what did the king answer? Uh, it caused a discussion. Uh, they all have read this book, but only some pupils uh, should guess that if there is nobody to judge, you will judge yourself. Uh, 
And after that, I continued the words uh, belonging to the sensible thing, that the most difficult thing of all. And it's more difficult to judge oneself than to judge others. If you succeed in judging yourself rightly, then you are indeed a man of true wisdom. They could not answer my second question, what did the little prince answer? I can judge myself everywhere. But in any case, this task stimulated a lot of pupils to read the book The Little Prince and discuss it with me. Now I would like to come back to the first picture. Uh, it's about history. When uh, wounded Elkiviat, uh, Socrates' pupil and dictator, was surrounded by Spartan phalanx, uh, Socrates protected his friend Elkiviat using his thuncheon. It was a battle. They were surrounded, and Roman soldiers could easily kill Socrates, but they did not do it. My question was, why did not they wound or kill Socrates? Uh, we had discussion, we remembered uh, ancient Rome, we remembered the moral courts, and they found the answer. He was Socrates, and Roman soldiers, being noble people, simply could not do it. And the last question, it's about teachers. Uh, Roman general Kimilev besieged the city fallacy, but he could not take it. And the teacher from the city, who was in reality the traitor, pretended that he would like uh, his children to do some exercises next to the walls of the city, and he delivered uh, the children to Camillus. Uh, the teacher told the Roman soldiers that they had already taken the city by having children in the camp. Camillus ordered uh, his uh, soldiers to give children the sticks. My question was, why did Camillus give children the sticks? It was difficult for them, but uh, they really managed to do it. Uh, Romans did not need traitors. Uh, that's why Camillus ordered to give children the stick to beat the teacher, and he wanted the children to come back to their city. After that, the city opened the gates. So uh, I tried to invent uh, interesting tasks because I was frightened by uh, the lack of uh, logical thinking. Mm, uh, our school is called by uh, our pupil, uh, Malchanov, uh, who, um, who was a um, test pilot and who uh, had the problems in La Bourget when he demonstrated uh, the tricks. And he preferred to uh, send his uh, plane to the wood and not to leave uh, the plane. That's why in our school we try to remember about moral standards, and for me it was very difficult uh, during the quarantine to do it. It's also useful to mention such challenge as academic dishonesty or cheating. Mm -hmm. This is also the problem to be solved. Staying at home and having a lot of opportunities uh, to cheat uh, really was very strong temptation for my pupils, and they finally, some of them, gave up. Setting the secret deadlines to each task especially have helped me to solve this problem. And I can't help mentioning the pupils who worked hard in these unusual uh, conditions. However, I would lie, I wanted to concentrate on the challenge that was uh, formulated above. Uh, that uh, most of all, uh, uh, I felt lack of individual communication between the teacher and the pupils. Uh, thank you for the attention. Thank you so much, Elena. That was really interesting. And I love seeing the, the conversation that's going on in the chat as well. Um, so, Kenjigal, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Great. Can you see me? Uh, we can, can you see me? We can hear you. Um, and we'll see your Let's slide. See. So, um, and what about thing? Can you see me? Uh, I can see you before Kendra go. Can you see me? I ask you. No, we can't see you, but we can. Oh, now we, we can. can see you now. We can see you now. Okay. <laughs> Glad to see you. Hello, everyone. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to uh, Cash and uh, Ellie, whom I contacted closely. Thank you for such a useful event. Uh, as, I, uh, as it was mentioned, I'm Kenja Gul Kadirova. I am from uh, Almaty, Kazakhstan. And uh, the Republic of 
Kazakhstan is the ninth largest country in the world. Kazakhstan um, takes uh, the dominant uh, position in Central Asia economically, primarily through its oil and gas industry. And it, it also has vast mineral resources. Kazakhstan borders uh, with Russia, China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and Turkmenistan, and also adjoins a large part of the Caspian Sea. Since 1997, the capital city is Nur Sultan, formerly known as Astana. It was moved from Almaty, the largest city of uh, our country. Now I would like to say a few words about uh, pandemic situation in my country. The virus was confirmed to have reached Kazakhstan on the 13th of May, 2020. On the 15th of March, President of our country, Kasim Jomar Tokayev, declared a state of emergency from the 16th of March till the 11th of May. On the 11th of May, when the quarantine ended in Kazakhstan and the number of infected people estimated a bit more than 4,000 people. But starting from June, it started to rise dramatically. And now it reached the number of uh, 67,000 uh, infected people. And in the 2nd of July, on the 2nd of July, a new one month uh, lockdown, less strict than the earlier one was introduced in response to rising case numbers. Thus, nowadays in our country, the second wave is happening severely. Now I would like to say a few words about my school. Would you show me the presentation about my school. Yes. Okay, next one. Next one, please. Next one, please. Next, okay. Uh, the Republican Physics Mathematics School is leading school in our country. Students from all over the country gifted in maths and physics are selected by passing entrance exam. Uh, applicants from other cities of the Republic of Kazakhstan having been enrolled in our school are provided with accommodation in our school hostel. Studying and living are free from charge of charge. And uh, if I talk about my uh, distance teaching, this event happened so unexpected, unexpectedly. We were just finishing the third term and our students were to write their final term tests, administrative term tests. Uh, earlier, we uh, had heard about coronavirus happening somewhere far away and it seemed that it would never reach our place. On the 16th of March, in the end of the working day, our administration gathered all teachers in our assembly hall and announced that starting the following day, we'll have online teaching. And we had to reorganize our lessons immediately. They recommended using Google platform and Meet for our online lessons. And uh, because Zoom, was used by almost all schools of the country and there could be uh, internet connection problem. So young, progressive, smart teachers, good at informatics, gave us instructions how to use Google Platform, Google Classroom, and we started creating term tests using blank test. Originally, we wrote our administrative term tests one parallel of grades writing their test in one time under uh, control of teachers on duty to exclude uh, academic dishonesty. Uh, so for the first time in the history of our school, we organized uh, our um, online tests. Thus, we finished the third term. 
we put our term marks in our electronic reg register called Kundelik functioning throughout, throughout our country. Uh, all Kazakhstani students have already been using it for two years. Fortunately, we had uh, spring holidays and we had time to uh, study the other uh, resources for online teaching. During our normal offline teaching, we actively used such programs as Kahoot, Socrative, Quizlet, and Quizalize for consolidation of our teachers' knowledge. So we successfully went on uh, using them. And one more application which was very useful for me was WhatsApp. Minding that all children keep their mobile phones by themselves, I gave the home task and listened to their retelling uh, via um, using WhatsApp. Uh, so um, the most challenging problem I uh, faced during COVID-19 crisis was the number of ta tasks which I had to check. Uh, totally, um, I had uh, 114 students and uh, it took time to check their grammar exercises, essays, listen to their retelling tests and uh, preparation for the next lesson, looking online material and using them effectively because the duration of the lessons was shortened and uh, preparing PowerPoint presentations were, was time consuming and that wasn't my eyesight and lack of movement affected my health, so my students is too. Then for me, the lack of practice in using some computer programs was challenging. Uh, once I prepared the final test for my uh, students and uh, when I uh, start, uh, wanted to give it out to my students, I found that it disappeared. I was in panic. I immediately phoned my colleague she gave me a helping hand and I managed to, to uh, give it out in time. So our school administration, the IT school administrators, my colleagues, teachers of English supported me. Our school administration let us take our school computer home, which was a reasonable decision, I think, because all teachers keep their material uh, uh, useful information in their school uh, computers. So the COVID-19 outbreak happened so suddenly for my students too. But their uh, young people are more flexible, you know, and they adjusted to this situation quickly. The only problem for some of them were, was that they lived in remote areas and where they had poor internet connection. And uh, some of them uh, had their parents who were uh, at home doing their job and siblings uh, studying at schools too. So, uh, minding these facts, I made a recording of lessons and sent them videos so they, they could watch them at an available time for them. And I give uh, more time for following them their home task. One problem to which uh, we couldn't find solution, uh, in some students, as the speaker before mentioned, uh, was the cheating of students. And some days earlier, Minister of Education of our country uh, declared that in September, it is obvious that the students will have online learning because of, there is a certain level of threat, uh, threat to the life of health of teachers and students. Thank you for attention, that's all. Thank you so that's much. Thank you so much, Kendra Gould, for your presentation and to everyone for these presentations. Um, 
it's been really, really great hearing your experiences and following what's been going on on the chat and, and seeing teachers really relating to a lot of these different experiences that you've been sharing. Um, before we move over to Benta, who will talk more about the, the minimum standards and some tools that you can use to, to address some of these issues, um, I just wanted to highlight some of the, the themes that emerged that you know, I'm seeing in the chat teachers are really relating to. So there were questions about how you get students to really think deeply and critically when you're teaching on Zoom. There was a question about self-care. There was a question um, about collaboration and some talk about collaboration between teachers. Um, issues of whether you do synchronous or asynchronous lessons. Um, there was a really insightful comment about um, the benefits of centralized education and the ways that governments are supporting education right now in certain parts of the world. Um, um, Hadil made the point about the challenge of m being a mother while doing this work um, and, and more broadly challenges of balancing your home life, uh, finding a home life balance and balancing being a parent and a teacher. Um, and then, of course, the challenges of using the technology. Um, so with some of these challenges in mind, some of these uh, similarities and issues that we're all facing, um, I want to turn it over to Benta, who's going to share a little bit more about what the INEE does and their tool, the minimum standards. Um, and she'll talk for about half an hour, present the tool, and then we'll come back and I'll bring together all the questions that you had both for the teachers and for Benta. So Benta, over to you. Thank you and good morning. And uh, I'm talking from, uh, from Norway, actually on the west coast of Norway. Um, it has been really interesting to listen to you all. And it is quite special that we are all in, in a crisis actually for the first time since the second world war and the generation we are in have many of of us have not been in a crisis like this before because we are even i am a little bit too young to have experienced the second world war um but the INE minimums, INE, uh, Natalie, she explained what INE, what it is, what kind of network it is. And the minimum standard was developed. You can see it, I have it here with me. Um, it's actually always with me because I call it my second Bible because it tells me a lot about how I can react to issues that uh, occur during an emergency. Um, and if you don't have the, the handbook itself, you can actually download it from our, uh, our website. So I really hope that you all can visit our website after this uh, webinar. And uh, I think we will, I, we will try, I will try to give you some ideas on what, how you can use the minimum standard. And listening to the teachers now, I, I hope that I can directly give you some idea ideas on how to go to, uh, to move forward. Next, next slide, please. Um, the, the minimum standard, as I said, well, it was developed the first one in 2004. And it is not that it's some people in the north or that has been doing. It has been an um, edu educationalist from 52 countries that came together and discussed how we could better have uh, come together and harmonize education and have a, have a tool that we could use to make education happen during crisis. Because the most important is that the minimum level of access to quality education, that is what everyone needs also in emergencies. And I heard one of the teachers said that it has been quite a challenge to be a mother and to be a teacher and to take care of the student at the same time that you are going to take care of your own own children and that's actually a big challenge and in a way the parents should not be the teachers 
for for their own uh, their children but some are have that role in addition to being a mother uh, the minimum standards are based on the Universal Declaration for Human Rights and Conve uh, the Convention of the Right of the Child. The next slide, please. I will try to not use the full half hour since we have we are already we will go over time, but I will have take the main points that is important for you to maybe use when you are developing education. Um, uh, programs for your students. Um, and the minimum standard is kind of divided in three. We have the standards, the why, the quality, uh, qualitative, aspirational and universal applicable in any environment. And, and, uh, and that is, they are followed, they are followed by key actions. That is um, uh, suggested way of achieving the standards or the what we do. Some actions may not be applicable in all contexts. They should be adapted to the specific context. And we have heard teachers speaking from many places in the world. And the Syrian teacher, she spoke about the pan uh, pandemic. In addition, Syria has been in, in a war situation situation for the last almost 10 years and and that is a crisis the pandemic in, is a crisis on top of the crisis that has been going on for a long time so they have a double issue in a way to 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 deal with so that was the why we have the what that is the standard the the why that is the key action and then we have the we have the, the, the guidance note. And the guidance notes cover specific points of good practice to consider when applying the minimum standards and adapting the key actions in different situations. The how we do it. They offer advice to priority issues and are tackling practical difficulties while also providing background information and definitions. Uh, then you can go to the next slide, please. And as you see, we have the circle. And the circle is kind of um, uh, the design, how we de have designed the minimum standard. It is a circle with the five domains. And the five domain, uh, domains is community participation, coordination and analysis and that is kind of covering everything within uh, a response but if you're really going into depth and need to have more uh, topics or more um, uh, specific issues on each of the, um, you know, the program you are developing or the uh, yeah the, the teaching you are going to do you have to to look into four other domains and that is access and learning environment. And that is very important these days for you. It is number three, that is teaching and learning. Number four, teachers and other education uh, personnel. And number five, that is education policy. And each of all this, again, is followed by a key action as, and a guidance note. And then to the next slide, please. So back to what we have experienced this, this spring. I was traveling in March. I was in Latin America doing a mission together with a donor. And it was Natalie and myself. And we experienced that something was happening around the world. And the very first message we got from government and gov uh, all over the world, it was, wash your hands and keep distance. And I was thinking, do we have an INE minimum standard that cover hand washing and can be directly connected to COVID-19? And yes, we have. Um, 
So if you have had your book now, you could have opened your book at page 131. And you could have found that domain two, that is access and learning environment. Standard number three under that domain is facilities and services that says, education facilities promote safety and well-being of learners, teachers and other education personnel, and are linked to health, nutrition, psychosocial and protection services. And the, sta and the standard is, um, and the standards is the why the quality achieve as aspirational and universal applicable to any environment. The thing is that the key action under facilities and services, that is the what, uh, sorry, that is, the, that is the why, are suggested actions to be taken in order to reach and meet the standard. And if you go to guidance note number six under facilities and services, it says safe water and hygiene promotion. And that is exactly what the government asked everyone to do, wash your hands. And that was important also to do in schools. What we were in addition thinking about for many places around the world, it was how do, do they have soap? Do they have clean water? How can they get clean water if not? And are they able to make soaps if they don't have any? And that is, of course, a different issue many places in the world, especially in refugee camps, but we are working a lot. Then we move to the next slide, please. And then I would like to give you some examples from each of the domain that, that I hope you can think through and that will encourage you to go to the minimum standard and see if you are able to use the book when you are developing your program. Um, on the domain, uh, foundational domain one, community participation, the minimum standard on page 22, the relevance to COVID-19, the crisis we have, we are experiencing today, and the distance learning guidance one. And that is quite, quite interesting because community participation, the relevance to COVID-19, distance uh, learning, participatory learning, Guidance uh, note number one, include, uh, inclusive community participation. So the linkage here is COVID-19 that, that you can link the, the distance learning to, community, uh, to participation. Community members participate actively, transparently, and without discrimination in analysis, planning, design, implementation, monitoring and evaluation of education responses. So that is something to consider when you are doing distance learning. Go to the foundational standard and see also how you can get, um, get kind of advice from, from others in the community to make and plan the education in a, in a better way if you feel that you do not have, have the, um, uh, the, the training or the, 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 uh, from, your, from your own school. If you then move to the, uh, let's see, uh, just a moment. And that you have standard number two, that is resources. And the resources is always important because uh, especially these days that you have moved from the classroom to uh, what you all, uh, everyone, uh, all the teachers has been ta talking about. Do you have the, uh, do you have the tablets? Do you have the, the, the laptops or the uh, smartphones that can help you to do education? And some students do not have that. And that is a challenge for, uh, for all of us. Then you can move to the next slide, please. 
uh, coordination is uh, uh, is one of the standards under the foundational standard and that is of course something that i i think many in context where they have uh, ongoing um, in in countries that i al uh, already have ongoing conflicts or disasters has happened uh, not uh, too long back and and then we have a coordination mechanism that is uh, important to to connect to during a, a time of crisis the next slide please um, the foundational domain analysis is important because you are able to assess the situation you have you you should be able to develop maybe a response strategy you could monitor how things are moving and you have to do an evaluation after maybe before you are moving into a normal kind of a normal education situation again um, if you move to the next slide we go into domain two that is access and learning environments and I have linked that also to COVID-19. Uh, and if we then look at uh, domain two, that is access and learning environments. Uh, and standard number one, that is equal access. All individuals have access to quality and relevant education opportunities linking that directly to COVID-19. Transition between different types of teaching and learning, access to home-based education. And then it's important to, to go to the guidance note and also see what the guidance note says about, uh, about um, equal access. And, and important for that to use guidance note number one, that is disc about discrimination. That means everyone has the right to education and should, no one should be left outside. And guidance num uh, note number three uh, is about a range of quality education opportunities. Guidance no number four says a lot of flexibility learning opportunities need to be flexible and adapted to the context and thinking about distance learning and home-based learning that is a challenge and then you also have guidance note uh, number nine that is minimizing the use of educational fa uh, facilities as temporary shelter so that was the directly to what all the teachers have been talking about and that is how you could make teaching and learning happen on distance and the transition between uh, different types teaching in the classroom and teaching uh, home base and uh, access to home-based education or teaching over internet can you move to sli uh, next slide please and then you have number three, domain number three, that is teaching and learning. And I have then uh, linked standard one, that is curricula. And that is also something that will be very different. And I heard one of the teachers talking about using, encouraging students to read more and to, to get into to older uh, stories. And of course, curricula, how could you use the curricula during a crisis like this? Culturally, socially, and linguistically, sorry, relevant curricula, curricula are used to provide formal and non-formal education, uh, appropriate to the particular context and need of learners. And that is back to the minimum standard the relevance to COVID-19. Curriculum adaptation from classroom to home-based teaching and learning. And if you go into and look at the, uh, look at the guidance note that, 
the guidance note that I have suggested that you should look at, that is guidance note number one, that is about curriculum is a plan of action to help learners to improve their knowledge and skill. And that is kind of go through it and see if you can adapt something and get ideas from that. Uh, guidance num uh, note number three is curriculum review and development. And then we have number eight and uh, number nine. That is about number eight is about diversity should be considered in the development of uh, and implementation of educational activities at all stages of emergency through the through to recovery so the period you are in now where you still are home based education but you are going back to a normal normal situation is really important guidance note number 9 that is about locally available learning materials. And that is something that is a challenge since not everyone have the, the technical uh, kind of, they are not equipped to, to kind of be part of uh, the education. Uh, then you can move to the next slide, that is domain four. And that is about teachers and other education personnel. Uh, what I did on that, um, I looked at uh, standard two, that is condition of work. And that is about the teacher, the teachers and all the education personnel. Um, the standard says teachers and other education personnel have clearly defined conditions of work and are appropriately uh, compensated. Link the minimum standard, the relevance to COVID-19. Condition uh, of work, remote teaching, condition of remote support and the role of parents and caretakers. Um, that is a challenge, M many issues that can be a challenge. And as some of you teachers talked about, it was that, um, it was that um, um, it is difficult to be a teacher and a parent. It's difficult to, it's a challenge to be at home following up your, teach, uh, your students. And it's, it's a challenge to be a teacher teaching on distance. The guidance note number one, um, number one is about job description. And that is actually important to think through. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, guidance no note number, uh, number one is about conditions of work. And that is important to go through together with your uh, you, uh, all the, the other teachers and also the principal in school so you can discuss if it's relevant and if it's how you can improve your situation as a teacher and then we are moving to the next slide please and that is very often i said domain number five is very, very important because it is about the education policy. So I used, I linked both uh, standards and tried to see the relevance to COVID-19. Standard number one is about law and policy formulation. Education authorities prioritize continue uh, con continuity and recovery of quality education, including free and inclusive access to schooling. And the relevance to COVID-19, government of ownership of education. They are the owner of the education system in a country. And they are responsible that all the children get ed uh, education even in time, times of crisis. Guidance note number one on the law and policy is the na national authorities duty is to respect, protect 
and fulfill the right to education. Minimum standard relevance, num uh, the standard number two, that is about planning and implementation. Education activities take into account international and national education policies, law, standards and plans, and the learning needs of affected population. The relevance to COVID-19, it is right to education. We have to remember that all the children have, have the right to education in all, uh, even in a crisis situation. Looking at the guidance note that I have mentioned here, it's guidance note number one, meeting education rights and goals. Number three, that is national and local education plans. Number four, that is resources. And number five, Transparency, uh, transparency and accountability. So that was, I knew that the time was flying here, to, would be flying today because we had many presentations. But so that's why I tried to link what I saw from the presentations and try to link how you could use the minimum standard and how to, you can move forward with by using the minimum standard in the work you are already doing. In addition to that, try to connect to other standards if you see that they can help you. So if you look at page 48 in them, or the next slide please, that is the map of all the standards and how you can see them holistically. But in addition, it is important to dig into each of the domains if you see that you can use them and also use the, uh, remember that the what are the standard the why is the key action and the uh, the how is the guidance uh, note and how you can really apply them to the work you are doing uh, i think i i used 20 minutes i have jumping a little bit back and forth because as, as I said, time, time wise, we were, was a little bit short. But I am I am here and I am open for questions. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Benta, for this introduction to the minimum standards. And um, as she showed, they're a really rich um, piece of guidance that we can use to and connect to the situation and and get a sense for how we should be framing our teaching moving forward. Um, so we've got some time for Q&A, both for Benta and Natalie about the INEE and the minimum standards, and also questions for um, the teacher presentations for Olena and Kenjagul, um, Hadil and Bruna. Um, so there were some questions earlier that were asked, so I'm gonna start with those. Um, but please feel free to keep putting questions in the chat um, and as well for you guys to jump in you know these questions are a starting point for our present our presenters but you as teachers who are participating in this webinar you also have a, your own experience and expertise in teaching in the past couple of months um, so there was a question for Bruna in particular but I think all teachers could could um, speak to this if it's relevant um, about collaboration between teachers. Um, so the question is, if teachers were teaching the same grade, teachers who are teaching the same grade or the same content found time or opportunity to collaborate with each other, um, was there time to plan content that would be similar for the same grade levels? And if so, do you have an idea of how those collaborations took place or what they looked like? Right. Can I? Yes, go ahead. Try to answer. Uh, I can just try to answer because I know at the elementary school level, in normal conditions, uh, they would have meetings every month. Um, planning is done very differently in Italy from 
how it's done in the States. Uh, so they would get together once a month and have a general plan or, you know, a very general idea so that in, in practice, basically, each class, and as I defined earlier, each group is, you know, 25 kids and two or three main teachers for five years. So each class is basically a, a world on their own, although they still work on the same, you know, skills and abilities and competencies, of course. Uh, but during this uh, lockdown uh, period, uh, we still had to do the same meetings, the same amount of meetings, but they were held online. Um, and uh, I think this, the, the very tight collaboration was among the two or three teachers in charge of one class. And they would certainly, uh, I'm sure they were uh, coordinating everything. Uh, so they would come up with ideas, you know, on how to do certain projects. Uh, so at least there was uh, cohesion, you know, among them uh, with the class. But uh, there was, even in my school, in high school, um, each class uh, was different depending on who the teachers were. And that's why I first, I said something about, you know, the lack of guidance, of guidelines, um, because basically we were left on our own. To, to devise what was best and uh, instead of having, uh, you know, a common, um, let's say, yes, common guidelines, uh, a common policy. Um, and so it was up to the teachers' initiatives, uh, initiative to get together. Uh, and we certainly spent lots of time, extra time. I mean, we put in so many extra hours. Uh, you can't imagine, I, as we all did, I'm sure. Uh, but it would have been better to be, you know, something uh, that, you know, we needed some coordination, I think, in the end. Um, so there were cases when, when actually families complained about the teachers not giving uh, a good enough performance uh, during these times. Thanks, Bruna. Um, I think... I mean, you just touched on so many things in your in your response. Um, but one of the things that stands out to me that I believe you also said during your presentation is the lack of guidance that was coming from above. Um, mm. And mm. I think that ties back to to these minimum standards, which are you know can serve as this global guidance um, mm. that that we can all turn to, especially when our schools or our districts or our state aren't providing those those guidance, which is happening in the US and I know for many teachers has been very frustrating. Um, for the other teacher presenters, Kenjigul, Olena, and Hadil, do you have anything to add about collaboration? Were you able to work with other teachers through this time? Is it possible? First of all, I want to, okay. Sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay, speak please. Uh, I believe that um, meetings with teachers uh, every week and uh, these, no, we call them courses, but in reality it uh, was not uh, the typical course. Those teachers who possessed uh, the information uh, really worked at school for more than 18 hours. And that's why everybody uh, uh, could have the chance to come and uh, to communicate with teachers. And for me, it uh, was such a great surprise that people whom I knew really showed uh, how in such a situation uh, they are ready to help. Um, in addition, these teachers have two, three children, but to stay at school from 8 a.m. till, for example, 9, 10 uh, p.m., uh, uh, having um, lessons and I want to say that these lessons were individual uh, that's why I believe that this act that our principal really uh, allowed teachers to take the devices and uh, uh, these video instruction and courses really helped us a lot because uh, uh, not everybody has somebody at home to help thanks Elena and Kendra Gold did you want to add to that Yes, first of all, I uh, want to I want to express gratitude to uh, other presenters 
who shared their time, valuable time, and uh, presented with uh, such useful information. We like uh, people in one ship sharing one fate and one problem. So thank you very much for all of you. It was a very productive meeting, I think. Thank you. Thanks, Kenja Gul. Um, there was another question that came up about um, whether teachers were teaching live to their students or, or um, putting things up online that teachers could do at their own time. Um, and Elena, it made me think of what you were telling me about the TV broadcast of lessons. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about how that worked um, in, in the Ukraine. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, some schools were chosen and uh, the school prepared the lessons. Of course, uh, we can't say that uh, they covered all the program. It was impossible, but it was additional help uh, from um, the Ministry of Education to the pupils who could uh, really see such lessons. And we try to uh, change our timetable according to the uh, time of these lessons to give our pupils the opportunity to see the lessons of history, the lessons of uh, uh, Ukrainian language, uh, and uh, that educational site that was created for the teacher. It is called to the lesson for teacher who is going to the lesson. Uh, Mm, demonstrated the uh, lessons of uh, the teachers uh, covering different topics. Of course, it was impossible to cover all the topics, uh, but uh, those who did not have electronic versions uh, really liked that side uh, and they could uh, uh, take the necessary information. It really was very helpful. So can you clarify, because um, the idea of TV broadcasting lessons is really unfamiliar in the US. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, how it worked? I don't know how it was organized because we only were given the links uh -huh. and we were asked to tell the pupils uh, what channels are involved. Almost all the channels were involved into this process and um, the broadcasting time was about uh, three, four, sometimes five hours a day. And that's why every uh, for every class and for every subject. And that's why uh, pupils uh, really sometimes simply agree their time with the teacher if uh, they wanted to see such a lesson. Hmm. Uh, I know that it was organized by the Ministry of Education. Simply don't know how it worked. I know that uh, there was a timetable for teachers in uh, definite school where they worked and. Uh, it was recorded and immediately uh, the next day appeared on TV channels. Great, thank you. And Praveen just said that in India, they're also doing telecast through TV channels every day, one hour per subject. Um, so it's really interesting to hear the different modalities that people are using. Um, you know, some of our presenters, Ken Jagul talked about using WhatsApp, Hadil talked about using Facebook. Um, so, it, you know, it's really interesting to think about how different teachers and different areas and different parts of the world are doing, um, are doing this. Oh, and Tammy says that in Seattle they did TV as well. Um, oh, this is so interesting. Um, so there was another question that came up about connecting to your students and relationship building during this time. Um, can any of you, Bruna, Olena, Kenjagul, or Hadil, talk a little bit about, about how you were doing that and maintaining your relationships, the personal aspect of, of teaching, the pers your personal relationships with your students? I can start. Um, uh, so I already, I think I wrote in the chat about um, holding tea times with my student uh, well, that works. Well, it worked because I was teaching uh, high school, so 12th grade, and um, this class in particular uh, really, 
um, I don't know, it inspired me to organize something outside the, uh, the regular class time so they could be all together because during the lockdown, I mean, everybody was just at home. They couldn't see their friends, they couldn't see anybody. And so it was important to have a moment of social life where we could all chat and it was not the teacher talking and them listening or, um, and they really appreciated it. Uh, and uh, with another class, I also um, held lessons outside the regular uh, lesson times just to interact with them, just to give them a forum where they could just chat as they would have uh, in class if we had been at school, especially because some kids experienced some really hard times. One kid lost his father to the COVID-19 uh, and others were affected in many other ways, even economically. So I think it was very important to keep them um, to make them aware that we were thinking about them as people, uh, not just as students. So that's, you know, a couple of things I did or, or messages and, you know, exchanging messages using uh, the tool that we were given, uh, whether it was classroom or whether it was WhatsApp groups, uh, but connecting with them uh, outside the regular, you know, the usual teaching times or assignments or, so personalizing the contact. Thank you. Um, do any, does anyone else, there's some um, comments in the chat coming in. Lisa said that um, she used live video conferencing for social interaction, for interpersonal communication and small group help. Um, in Colombia, kids have to wear their school uniform and they start classes at six o'clock in the morning until one o'clock. That's really early. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, Caitlin has a question here. She says, is anyone going back next month? My district is having the full student body back every day and I'm struggling to find out how to organize lesson plans around the restrictions. Much of it runs counter to how I usually teach. May I take that one? Yes, please. Sorry. Uh, this was so beautifully explained earlier when we were talking about kind of minimalizing. As teachers, we often like to go big. We like to have a lot of things, but really what we all kind of have to do during this pandemic, but also in a lot of moments where there's um, a lot of things going on and it doesn't even have to be for the whole class. It might be for that one kid who you know is going through a hard time. Figure out what are the top three or four things that you need the kids to know and just focus on that. Mm -hmm. Focus more on, since I'm a social studies teacher, so instead of memorizing dates so much, maybe some of the nice fluff stuff uh, I'm trying to figure out, okay, what is essential for my kids? And it's hard, but I think right now we have to look at like those kids who are getting up at 6 a.m. and having to be on the computer till one. What is the best way that we don't A, overwhelm our students, B, still teach them, and C, make it um, fun for them? Great, thanks. And I think that, I mean, it's just gonna be such a challenge to figure out how you can make it fun and engaging without the small group work um, and some of the things that you might normally do that we can't when we're trying to socially distance in the classroom. Um, for people who are interested, and I'm seeing in the chat, a lot of people are going back and have questions. The fourth webinar in our series, which is actually gonna be held on a Thursday evening instead of a Friday morning, um, We'll, we're going to hear from teachers who have already gone back, a teacher in New Zealand, in China, and Korea, and they'll be talking to some of this. Um, so I encourage you to register for that one as well. Um, and similarly, the, the questions we were talking about with building personal relationships, um, our third webinar is going to be focused entirely on uh, providing psychosocial support and social emotional learning and how you how you can do that connectedness, um, whether it's overline, over, 
the internet or in person. Um, and that one will be held on July 31st at 10 a.m. Um, let's see, there are more questions coming in. Um, I wanna make sure there was a question earlier about um, behavioral issues. So someone said that they had a rough time with classroom management. Do you have any effective advice for students who are highly intelligent but have behavioral issues? Um, does anyone have anything to comment to contribute to that question? Hello? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, I'm a dean of students at a high school in Minnesota. And, um, and, and one, of my, one of my jobs is to work with discipline uh, when we're at school, but when we are not uh, there, um, sorry, my video was off. Um, when we were uh, online, um, we, we found a lot of um, plagiarism and academic dishonesty. And uh, what, what, what turned to be the, the number one thing that we did was uh, uh, incorporating parent and parent support. And so we, we basically had meetings with uh, kids in question and parents and um, basically having Zoom calls with them. Um, we, we were fortunate enough that we really didn't have any issues with, uh, like zoom bombing or anything like that. Um, but the academic dishonesty piece was probably the most difficult. And, um, we had to basically work with the family and the student and encourage, um, encourage students to show what they know and, um, uh, allow parents to understand that this is not a consequence. It is something that we were doing to uh, uh, to, uh, help everyone learn. Mm. Great. Thanks so much, Eric. Um, in the interest of time, I want to be sure that we wrap up on time. Um, so thank you all so much for your questions, for your contributions. Thank you to our teacher presenters. 